Yeah, we can climb about that. One of, the, one of the coolest things about the baptisms were um, as we dunked them under the water and, and brought them back up out of the water, I mean, the whole family like cheered and it was like awesome and cool. So anyway, I'll, I'll get back. All right, let me get to our message today. When my daughter Rebecca was in high school, she uh, was in a relationship with a guy that had her on a very destructive path. Beth and I tried to speak to her about it. We prayed real hard. Matter of fact, Beth would lay on her bed and weep and pray scriptures over our daughter. And we were, we were kind of at that place where we were really sharing our concerns, uh, but we stopped short of intervening and inserting our parenting will because we knew what, what the risk. I mean, she was, she was like a high school senior. Right, And so we knew the risk of that. And so we kept praying and we kept talking to her, but we, we, we were just stopped short of intervening and inserting our parenting will. To protect Rebecca, i, I got to tell you, this is her story too, um, not just Beth and I's story, so I'm not going to share details. Uh, however, the relationship continued with this young man to the point until Beth and I believed we did have to step in and assert our wisdom and our love and make a decision for her because she was a minor. We knew it was a great risk. She could rebel. She could, we could lose our relationship with her. And, and I remember how mad she was as we sat there on the floor talking. I remember how hurt she was. I can remember what she said, and I can remember the silence. I remember saying this, I love you so much that I am making this decision for you. You may not believe me, but this is my responsibility as a dad. And so it's so important, it is worth risking our relationship forever. Would you do me a favor? At your tables, I'd like for you to share with others what are some reasons you might be willing to risk a friendship to have that needed conversation. What are some reasons that you might be willing? I'm not talking about necessarily. Hypothetical is fine. You don't have to say, oh, well, this friendship and this is why. You don't have to do that. Hypothetical is fine. What would, what would it take for you to step over the line and stop just being quiet about something and actually talk to a friend about something going on in their life that you felt like the scripture really spoke into, but they weren't listening? Talk, talk about that at your table or in your circle. That would be something. If you're a first-time guest, this is probably catching you by surprise. We do this a lot, and so you're welcome just to sit and listen. Uh, but I, I invite you to join in. I want you to turn with me to the book of Philemon. I want you to turn with me to the book of Philemon. If you have your Bible apps, you're welcome to go there. If you're carrying a, 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 a scriptures with you, turn to Philemon. Philemon is a very short book. Um, it's a short letter, actually, from the Apostle Paul to a dear friend of his. Philemon seems to be a leader in his church, and the church meets in the home of a ministry couple named Aphia and Ar Archippus. Archippus, sorry. And Paul mentions Archippus in his letter to Colossians. So uh, Philemon probably lives in Colossae or lives in Laodicea because that letter was supposed to be interchanged between the two churches and exactly where Paul talks about him. That's way too much information. Paul is writing to ask Philemon to do something that is counter to the culture, but it is consistent with the kingdom way. Right? So it's counter to culture, but it's consistent with the kingdom way. Paul's not assuming that Philemon will choose the world's way. However, he wants Philemon to he wants to make sure that Philemon makes the best decision. 
And so he writes a letter. And it's kind of an open letter. Because it's not just to Philemon, it's to the whole church. And, and so he kind of lays it out there. Philemon's decision that he has to make holds a man's life in the balance. Now I've got to tell you, this past week has been a very difficult week. Um, there have been multiple people in our church family who have had to have difficult decisions with people they love about decisions that they have or are we're soon going to make. Let me share with you one of those. I'm not going to use names. Um, but one of those discussions was a young lady who confided into a friend that she had an appointment the next morning to have an abortion. And so texting back and forth with Beth and I and praying together and um, this lady made the decision that she was going to have a conversation with that young lady. And um, the young lady was 16 and, and her, she said her parents would support her whichever decision she made, but it was her decision at 16. And so uh, a long conversation, lots of prayer, lots of tears, and I have to just be real honest. I wasn't going to share this part of the story, but to be real honest, the girl chose to keep her appointment. Because not every time that we stand up and share God's truth out of love, not just for love for the person, but, but love for the future, because right whether it was Rebecca's situation or this young lady's situation, we step in and we talk to them about what's going on because we can see that the path they're on is destructive. And so we have to speak into that or choose to be silent. And when the Holy Spirit prompts us or brings us into the, oper into the situation where we have the opportunity to speak, the real question is, will we? Right, I mean, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that. As believers, we're often put in these positions and set, uh, set in and have these conversations with people on topics that are not fun and are very difficult. These conversations are so hard and they put our relationship with them at risk. Paul was willing to take the risk. Let's look at how he approaches the subject, makes the ask, and then leaves Philemon to make the right decision. So my, what I want to talk about is how to make a big ask of a friend. Right? And so this is, this is a, this, when we make big ass of friends, sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's like, sometimes it's like the experiences this past week. It's negative. But I believe that we can, there are some principles that Paul uses that can help us in those conversations. So the first thing, as we look at Philemon, the first thing that we see is Paul says, value the relationship over being right. Value the relationship over being right. Let me, let me read some scripture and then we'll come back to that. In verse 4, Philemon, uh, Paul says this. He says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. See, one of the problems in our culture is that relationships have become disposable. And I know that not everyone in the relationships necessarily see the relationship as disposable, but for so many, the, it, you know, because it takes two or three in a relationship, the, it becomes disposable to at least one person, and so it becomes difficult to navigate those difficult situations. See, people have come to believe that unless you agree with me, you cannot love me. Have you noticed that in our culture? Well, I, I, I don't want to get on my soapbox because i got so much to say. Let me, let me stick to what, my script here. In the kingdom of God, there are two principles that apply when it comes to relationships and disagreements. Actually, there's more than that, but there's two that I want to talk about today that fit into with what I'm talking about. The first one is the power of one. What is the power of one? It's unity. Jesus prayed for unity. Remember, that's, that's one of his top priorities is unity within the body of Christ. And how do we navigate difficult situations? You see, un unity is not based on agreement on every issue. Unity is not based on agreement on every issue. Unity is all about valuing the relationship in Christ over being right. 
Unity doesn't call on us to agree. It calls on us to value one another even in our disagreements. The second one is authenticity. The second one is authenticity. Authenticity is the ability to have a difficult discussion, disagreement, even an argument without devaluing the other person. Let's go to a biblical example. You may not know who these people are, but there was a guy by the name of Paul and his best friend, Barnabas. And they had been, doing, they had been traveling together, doing ministry together, all over uh, the known world at that time. And uh, it came that they were getting ready to go back and read and, and, and do more. They had taken some time off to visit some, some of their people who were supporting him, and they took some time. And then it was time to go again. And the disagreement was over a young man who, um, who was struggling. His name was John Mark. And he, 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 had, he had gone with them before, but he had only gone so far and got homesick and went back to be with his parents. And so Barnabas wants to take John, Mal- John Mark again, and Paul doesn't. And the scripture says they had such a stark disagreement that when it was all said and done, they decided that they would do both. Paul would go out and cut new territory and Barnabas would take John Mark back to the churches they had already been to and and, and equip and train and encourage them. And so even though they had this very difficult uh, disagreement and they chose to go different ways, as we see in Scripture later on, Paul talks about how much he loves Barnabas. And later even talks about how important it was that John Mark was part of his life and ministry by the time he was in prison. And and so you see, this idea of authenticity means that we are going to be passionate about things. And we're going to stand our ground on things. But it doesn't mean that we have to devalue the other person just because we do. I can tell you one arena that this is so important for believers, and that is politics. It is so sad that we can't have conversations and, and, and talk about politics, especially even with believers, without, without it creating a rift. Disagreements are fine. Having differences of opinions, fine. But how can we not still love the person, even if we disagree? The things that we, we have to stand firm on and we cannot compromise are the truth, the revealed truths of Scripture. Right? We can't, re- we, we can't compromise those. But, but, but we can certainly value the other person even if we don't land on the same side of the fence. There are people who, are, who love Jesus and are a lot smarter than me have differences of opinion on some passages of Scripture. But it doesn't mean that I think they're evil. It's just we don't see the exegesis of the passage the same. I still believe I'm going to celebrate in heaven with them. It's okay with me. So there are some some pieces in Scripture, though, that is is important. Uh, The essential truths of the gospel. That Jesus... It was God. He came to earth and became one of us. He lived a sinless life. He, born of a virgin, you can add that in there. He, he lived a sinless life. He died a substitutionary death in our place. He was buried. He rose again. And he ascended into heaven. And he is going to come back someday. Those are essentials. We cannot compromise on those things. But there are other things that we find unity on that we have to be able to talk through and be able to communicate about. So you can't compromise on biblical truth. But we can love one another and even as we try to help them understand it. Even if they are not ready to accept it right away. So, first thing is, is value the relationship over being right. The second thing is appeal from that relationship not power. Appeal from that relationship, not power. Therefore, Paul says this in verse 8, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Right? The world is about power. The kingdom is about love and serving others. Jesus said the Gentiles lord it over, but not you. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be the servant of all. 
That's what he talks about. Leadership, whether it's an official position or just influence that you have because of your faith in Christ, look, people look up to us. As believers, people look up to us. They're looking to see. We just finished a series on uh, intentionally imitatable. And we talked about this. There are some people, obviously, who look up to us because they, they can't wait for us to fail. And they say, see, I told you, Jesus isn't real. The whole church thing, that's not, that's not important. But there are many, many, many others who are looking to see not just how we live and make good decisions, but how we handle our bad decisions, how we handle our mistakes, how we handle our sin, how we handle bad things that come upon us that aren't even our fault. People are looking. And so we have to be intentionally imitatable. We have to imitate God so that others can see how and who God is. It's all about them discovering God's love. You cannot approach a difficult subject with someone until they know that you love them. It's a biblical pattern. And that they, that they understand that you don't see them as someone holier than thou or, or more spiritual, but you're looking at them eye to eye as equals. Because the, the idea of, of the journey with Christ is it's a meandering path through the, world, uh, through the world, right? And so if you know, you can go a long way on a journey on a meandering... Um, yeah, I just said the word. I should be able to say it again. Uh, meandering path and not have advanced really far ahead of somebody else, right? And, and so what we understand is the idea of humility. We have to understand that, that it's kind of like the distance... Yeah, the distance between New York and L.A. is a long ways on earth. But compare that the distance between earth and the sun, and it's not even noticeable, right? I mean, you, you, so it's all a matter of perspective. So when it comes to being, if we're just judging human beings, maybe it seems like there's a huge amount of difference. But when we're looking at ourselves against the character and nature and the person of God, there's no difference between you and me ever. No matter how bad you are and how good I am. Or probably the other way around, how bad I am and how good you are. <laughs> That'd be the truth of it, right? You guys, you, you can, thanks, Mike. Just calling me out on that. That's excellent. All right. So, so you value the relationship over being right. And the thing is always appeal from the relationship, not from power. This idea of humility, right? Let's move to the third one. The third one is be simple and straightforward. This is not my strong suit. If there's a, if there's a bush out there, I want to beat around it. Because <laughs> I just hate saying something that I know is going to hurt somebody or is going to be what they don't agree with. Um, and and it might, they might think differently of me. That just is like the worst thing for me. But Paul is straightforward and he's simple and straightforward. After we affirm our love and appreciation of our friend, after we confirm their value, we have to breach the subject simply and straightforward. Philemon was a slave owner. Okay, in our culture, we're ready to throw him out. We won't even remember him ever, right? Before we get upset, it was more like an indentured servant. Onesimus or his parents owed Philemon money and he had to work it off. However, Onesimus apparently ran away before the debt was paid, which put him in a very uh, slippery situation with Philemon. Philemon uh, had a lot of options on, on what he could do, not only to find Onesimus, but what, what he could do to Onesimus for running off like that. So here's the good news. Somehow, Onesimus ends up in Rome. And because of Philemon's relationship with Paul, Paul knew Onesimus. And so no matter what happened, Onesimus ends up seeing Paul in jail, and Paul leads him to Christ. Right? And so now the letter is all about Paul sending Onesimus back 
to be back home with Philemon, but with a special request. Okay, that's, that's what Paul's asking here. So that's what's going on. Now let's pick it up at verse 10. Paul writes, That I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. That means that he led him to Christ. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to have kept him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do, excuse me, any favor that you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in Christ. I got to tell you a story. Um, a very close friend of mine, a guy who was in my very small group, he was, he was um, a leader in the church where I was serving. And he moves out. He leaves his wife because he just wasn't feeling it anymore. So I went to him. I went to him and, and pretty much used the same tactic that Paul used with him. I talked about how much I loved him, how much I appreciated him, how much he meant to me, and how much I understood that he was going through a difficult time in his marriage. But I said, dude, you need to get this figured out and get home. And I said, as a pastor, it's my responsibility to say you need to step out of leadership for a season until you get it figured out. But I don't want to do that. I beg you, look at the situation you're in. Choose for yourself to take time off and attend to your own marriage, attend to your own home, get this figured out and get home, then step back in to ministry. And he looked at me and said, thank you so much for saying that. Not because I was forcing him out, but because he didn't know how to breach the subject with me. Because he knew that he shouldn't be leading. But he didn't want to tell me. We've got to approach these situations with love. Look, Paul first introduced this issue simple and straightforward. He acknowledged the size of the problem. Paul also pointed out the value of doing the right thing. So let's look at the next thing. Make the ask and leave it. Now, I'll share a little bit about what leaving it looks like, but here it is. So if you consider me a partner, this is the ask. If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. We don't want to control other people. We don't even... Well, because we, what is the value in controlling other people? That just becomes some kind of religious thing, right? Right? We want to equip others to make right decisions. We want to encourage and help them hear from God and follow Him into the truth and making the right, the best decisions. See, the truth is, is we can't choose for them. I, you know, as a parent, when your children are younger, you can make them do things, right? Right? But as they grow up, you realize that what you should have been doing all along was teach them to make good choices because when they get older, they need to be making good choices. 
when you're there, but even when you're not there. Although what I've, what I've noticed as a parent, but also noticed as other children is they're way better when they're not with you than they are when they're with you. So I'll just give you some encouragement there. See, they have to choose. Jesus has done everything possible. Listen to this. Jesus has done everything possible to have eternal life. But each individual has to choose it for themselves. Whether we're talking about the entirety of this idea of following Jesus or even just a, a, a situation that we're facing in our life with a choice that we have to make. See, the most difficult thing for me in sharing this message today is it's so fresh and, and, and difficult because of last week. Because the, the number of this conversations that had to happen last week and, and didn't end well. But I'm sharing it because I've been, this message has been on the schedule for almost a year for this week. I'm just wondering why it wasn't last week. You know? But God, I believe, is sovereign, and I believe that He has this. Listen, let's go back to my story with my daughter, Rebecca. Right? Rebecca had a choice. She could choose to rebel. She could choose to hate me. Because Rebecca was so mad. <laughs> Let me tell you this. I told you I wasn't going to share a lot of details, but I'm going to share this one. I have her permission to share this, okay? She was so mad, she jumped out of her second story bedroom window and hurt her ankle. She was running away. She backed her car out of the driveway without starting it so that I wouldn't hear her. You know, we have a little bit of an incline, so she just put it in neutral and backed it out, got it in the middle, middle of the street. So the car's in the middle of the street, and it wouldn't start. And so she left it there. Well, she tried to push it out of the middle of the street by herself, but she ended up leaving it there. And so she began to walk. And, and she made it uh, just a little past the roundabout, if you know where we live, out of the subdivision, starting down the main drag. She, she got a little bit away, but the pain was so great she had to come back. And she had to knock on the door to get in. <laughs> and in tears, she asked me if I would help her get her car back in the driveway because it was in the middle of the street. Now, I want you to know it took months for our relationship to heal. But today, she has a beautiful family. She has provided me two beautiful, wonderful grandchildren. And we enjoy a great relationship with them. Oh, and by the way, I anticipated her trying to run away, and I had to unhook the battery from her car. <laughs> so, all I did was hook the battery up and pull the car into the driveway. And she glared at me. But I'll say, we can laugh about it today. Um, as a matter of fact, when we were talking about me sharing the story, she said, Dad, I am so sorry that we went through that. But I am so glad you stepped in. Yeah. And uh, our, we have a great relationship. Um, but it was intense and one of the scariest moments of my life. Risking the relationship with my daughter to protect her and her future family. Because whether she ever liked me again, whether we ever enjoyed closeness in our relationship again, I believe that what I said to her was so important for her to hear for her family, her future family, that I was willing to risk my relationship with her so that she could have what she has today. So whether you are a parent, a spiritual leader, or someone who loves a friend, at some point you'll be faced with a situation where you'll have to take a great risk in your relationship. Because of your love for them, you'll be able to see things that they can't see about the path they're on and the destruction that's coming because of their choices. 
And so I hope that you somehow, the Holy Spirit will bring this message back into your, maybe you won't remember that I said it, but it'll bring these ideas back to you and you'll be able to use this simple process for approaching the conversation. The one thing I haven't talked about how important it is to pray and prepare and pray and prepare and pray and share and pray. Because when I said share it, ask it, and leave it, well, you, you leave it in their hands, but you continue to pray. Right? You can't just keep going back and hammering it and hammering it and hammering it. That you've got to share it and leave it, but you don't have to leave the throne of God over it. Right? You can continue to storm the throne of God because sometimes when you share things, they do get mad and it takes months to heal and, and sometimes what you said doesn't, make a, doesn't matter to them and doesn't make a difference to them for a very long time. But once you've said it, the Holy Spirit has that now to use in their heart and they can begin to make changes in their heart. But let me just remind you of this, the, the simple process. It's value the relationship. In the conversation, that's where it has to start. You have to start by valuing the relationship. Appeal from that relationship, not power. It's a humility approach. Be simple and straightforward. Don't beat around the bush. Right? Make the ask and leave it. Don't just keep hammering it. A parent, there's a little different story there with parents, but... but for most of us, it's a matter of putting it in their lap and letting them and the Holy Spirit deal with it. Okay? Maybe you're here today and you were the one who had to make a hard decision. Maybe the decision you made didn't turn out so well. Whether somebody spoke into your life or not, maybe that's you. And maybe you're dealing with guilt and shame over what happened. And here's the truth. Jesus offers forgiveness to you. He says, I love you. Uh, one of the songs that we sang today about his overwhelming love, I, can't, I get the words all mixed up, but it talks about how he loved me. You know, even when I was his enemy, he loved me. And he pursued me. I've heard people say it this way. God was so upset about the idea of not spending eternity with us in heaven with him that he sent Jesus to die. God has done everything possible because God has made it easy for everyone to choose eternal life. But he has left it in our hands. He values the relationship. God is a gentleman. He leads from the relationship. He appeals from the relationship, not from power. He doesn't make any of us make the decision. It's our choice. Right? Now, one of the differences with God is He's constantly making people for us to come home. Yeah. Right? And, but He doesn't force the issue. It's our choice. The thing about Jesus, not only does he offer forgiveness, but he's the master of recalculation. It doesn't matter how far you've gone down that, that path, how, how, how much of the destruction you've already started to experience in your life. Jesus says, I can forgive you and I can recalculate your life and I can put you on a new trajectory to the place that, I've call, that I'm calling you to all along. Because he can take the firestorms in our lives and the ashes that are left behind and he can make things beautiful out of it. That's who he is. That's what he's offering. So if that's you, that's what Jesus is asking and offering you today. For the rest of us, not just the rest of us, you too, all of us, He's saying, 
That's the ministry of reconciliation that God has given to us. Right? It's this idea of the good news of the gospel. That it's our privilege, yeah, it's our responsibility, but it's our privilege to go out and love the world for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. So it's our privilege to go out and love the world that they might discover God's love. But it's also our privilege because Jesus said, just as the Father sent me, in other words, out of love, Jesus says, out of love for them, I'm sending you. That's us. That's us. We're the ones who get to go out and offer reconciliation. That means that we're going to have some tough conversations sometimes. People in the world, people within the body of Christ that we have to have tough conversations with sometimes, difficult conversations. And let's pray that we can have unity and authenticity where we don't compromise truth, but we are overboard on love. Right? That's our job. To love people. That's our job. So, if you need to talk to me about something that's happened in your life and, 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 and getting things right with Christ, um, or I'm not sure what's going on in your life, but if you need to talk with me, I'll be over here by this speaker. Um, if you need someone to pray with you, if you have a prayer request that you want to turn in, Jill LaRock will be over here by the cross and she'd be happy to pray with you, take your prayer request. And um, so we're going to sing and um, right after I get done pr uh, praying and then uh, when we're finished, you can come up and talk with either one of us. Father, we love you because you first loved us. And we know that relationships can be messy and uh, Lord, we are committed to working through those. But that means sometimes we have to have these tough conversations. And so Lord, I pray that you would always prepare us, take any plank out of our own eye before we ever try to take a speck of dust out of someone else's. Lord, work within us. Use us. Use the truth that we speak, not just as we speak it, for however long it takes for that person to see the light of your truth and to come off the path that's headed for destruction and move again into life and what you offer. So God, help us. We're imperfect and we come from a position of imperfection and it's so hard and I just pray, God, for your forgiveness when we don't do it well. But I pray for the courage and the boldness and the words to speak in those situations for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me, please? It's my prayer for you that God's peace fills your heart and that as you go throughout your lives this week that you share God's peace with others. Let faith rise up Upon the sea till I'm dead.